I don't think providing liquidity against good collateral is a bailout. I mean, banking I'm, is runnable. Bank I agree with you. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Harvard Kennedy School Research Fellow, former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and financial expert, Sir Paul Tucker, who in this video talks about the threat of the might of China, trade, global economy, and fractured global world order. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. The U.S. runs, you know, uh, is the printer of the global hegemonic currency, the dollar, there is an avid demand for do, you know, dollar-based debt instruments. So when China runs a trade surplus and the U.S. runs a trade deficit, uh, they, they just, you know, we basically get, we, we, we buy more than they sell from us and we you know, create paper that uh, they put, put in their treasuries. On the face of it, it sounds like a pretty good deal for America. What am I missing from that, you know, oversimplified analysis? No, it's a really great question, of course. So I think the place to start is, well, China's subsidizing and America's getting cheaper imports. That's that's good for consumers because it means that whatever their real disposable income is, they've now got more of it and they can spend a bit more on other things. I mean, everyone always defends, not everyone, a lot of people tend, particularly business people, tend to defend and think of free trade in terms of exports. Free trade is all about the benefits of imports uh, and cheaper imports and what economists call comparative advantage. Now, this isn't always wonderful. Um, in aggregate, it can be wonderful, but it can be costly to particular industries and particular localities. And the United States, I mean, there's now research that shows that some local areas did suffer um, because of cheaper imports from China. Now that it, of itself doesn't make trade a bad thing because America is a very rich country and it could have done more to redistribute resources in the United States and help retrain people and things like that. But if China continues to grow at an absolutely vast rate, say it becomes four times as big as the United States, well then the United States, and it continued to subsidize um, exports, the United States would not be able to afford to, um, to offset the costs, the social costs. Um, of of subsidized imports, the monetary side of this is 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 very interesting in that another part of this. So I'm now completely switching tack to the Please. monetary and financial things, which is so if you're subsidizing um, exports, you can think of this as a mercantilist policy, in which you, in this case China, becomes a net saver. Um, and if if the country is very big, as it is, what that does is it pushes down the world real interest rate, which pushes up asset prices, which helps to create the kind of sense of froth that we've had at times over the past 25 years. You know, one of the great mysteries, in, in, I mean, it's not a kind of luxury mystery, it's a burning mystery, is why have world interest rates been so low? And one of the explanations is that China and after the 1990s crises, other East Asian countries have become massive net savers. And so um, the world real interest rate needed to fall to, um, to bring them into balance. The other part of it, of course, is um, the counterpart to the China surplus, which isn't so big anymore, um, was was cumulative external deficits um, in the United States and my own country, the United Kingdom. Um, um, and that can't go on forever. There is a point at which that would become unsustainable and where that would, and suddenly people would flipping flip from thinking, the dollar's the world's safest and most liquid asset to maybe the United States isn't going to be able to service its debts. We're nowhere near that point mm -hmm. um, at the moment. And we've seen over the last week, again, a kind of rush into treasury bills during stressed market conditions. 
But it is important always to remember that just as governments can't run deficits beyond their capacity to repay one day, so countries can't um, either. And so these Im imbalances in the world economy during the 1990s and, and 2000s were, were problematic. And the, the IMF, the G20, uh, all sorts of fora tried to, to get back to a better position, which essentially involved China consuming more at home and America and the UK and others consuming less um, at home, and none of it ever came to, to anything, um, refused India a swap line. And my response was, don't they realize India is going to be a power? And so my thought was, um, it's a mistake to alienate Delhi, because in the 21st century, the West is going to need to have a friendly relationship with Delhi. And so I thought the decision was about the pay grade of the Federal Reserve. Um, I was not arguing, if, frankly, against, which would be against my previous book, Had Elected Power, that the Federal Reserve should itself be weighing geopolitics and deciding what to do. But I did think it should have gone to the White House or the State Department. And if the United States saw foreign policy reasons for providing a line, well, then the US Treasury could do that and the Fed could could finance the Treasury. Uh, I didn't think the chair of the Fed should sit around doing geopolitics. But I do think they, I think this is true beyond central banking. Um, I think that the holders of power, in particular specialized areas, need to be sensitive to the wider interests. Let me put it this way. Um, and I think I talk about this in the introduction that. From most of my time in office, frankly, I was a staffer for 20 odd years and I was a policymaker for a dozen years or something. Um, and for most of that time, you could be a specialist in monetary and financial policy, which is what I was, without knowing anything about trade policy. You, you had to know some trade economics, for God's sake, but you didn't need to know the stuff that trade negotiators know. Um, and even if somebody rather marvelously knew about monetary, financial, and trade policy, they didn't need to know about the laws of the sea, or war and peace, or health policy, or environmental policy. So we all lived in our little specialist silos, if you like. And I think that's over. I think the stakes are, are too high. And that doesn't mean that everybody should be doing everybody else's job, which would be appalling. But I think you need to know enough, or that they need, the incumbent, today's incumbents need to know enough about other parts of government. So as it were, knock on the door and say, I've got this thing that's going to sound really techy, but I think it really matters to you. And the person you're visiting says, no, 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 no. Um, and then here's just monetary financial mumbo jumbo. And they say, no, 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 no. This is going to make, in this case, Delhi really fed up. And I'm not going to do it because it doesn't fit with my mandate. But you need to think about this. And you need to have the, you need to have the knowledge, sufficient knowledge, literacy, I would call it, to be able to knock on those doors, and then re you, a relationship already that when you go through the door, the person doesn't think, I've never met this person before. Who the hell are they? So this is kind of metaphorical. Um, and I, I just think that matters enormously. I'll give you an example now of how a live one in the United States. So the debt ceiling debate is being, is, is, we're at that part of the political cycle um, again. And it's important to put it like that because this has happened before and it's a hard knuckle combat within the Beltway where the stakes are pretty high in terms of domestic politics. And I want to say, um, this has come up since my book was published, but there's a, a similar example in the book, but this is a better one. Um, I want to say, no, no, it's not like before. Vote default, vote Beijing. That, that, if, that if the debt ceiling isn't lifted and the United States defaults, that's a gift to Beijing. And I don't think this has crossed people's minds because the very people that um, are contemplating a default are probably among the people most worried about the challenge presented to the United States by Beijing. And 
my point isn't to make criticisms of individuals in Congress or elsewhere, let alone of their party platform, but everybody's just got to raise their game in a way that my generation of policymakers didn't need to. Mm -hmm. I mean, extraordinary challenge of the times that our political leaders need to be bigger, uh, just to, during a period where for a while, probably in many places, they've been smaller. Um, you've raised three things. One is um, inflation. So my own view is that the central banks didn't need to continue QE on quite the scale they did during the whole of 2020. My view is that, this is without hindsight, my view is that when the um, Biden administration um, launched the very large fiscal stimulus in 2021, the Federal Reserve should have raised interest rates a bit. Um, so I've got them stopping QE 2000, in, in the middle of 2020, and I've now got them raising interest rates in 2021. In, in parts of Europe, the labor force um, shrank very sadly because lots of people have got long COVID and, um, and other people have chosen to retire early, which all of which is kind of part of that is sad and part of it not so sad. Um, that reduces the labor force and therefore aggregate supply is on a lower path and therefore you need to push aggregate demand onto a lower path. So you need to have tighter policy. Um, but instead they said, no, we, we, they carried on stimulating. It wasn't just that they were sitting still, they carried on stimulating policy during um, this period. And and then they said inflation was transitory. And I think there was quite an important symbolic mistake during that period in that they didn't sound very concerned about inflation. And I think that's a great hazard for a central banker uh, because you, you must always be concerned about inflation getting out of control upwards or downwards into deflation. It's symmetric. But you... The people talk about the anchor. The anchor is the committee. The anchor is the men and women on these committees. And, and, and people need to feel completely assured that they care about maintaining the anchor above everything else, everything else. And so I think that there have been unforced errors in monetary policy and that they're now playing catch up the a bailout, I, as I use the word bailout, a bailout is when um, is when taxpayers provide solvency support in some way or guarantees. I don't think providing liquidity against good collateral is a bailout. I mean, bank I'm, is runnable. Bank I agree with you. Yeah. Runnable. If I if I sitting there or you know the people who are in central banking, if they lend against um, collateral. You know, sensibly valued uh, with with haircuts. That's not a bailout. Mm -hmm. The bank the bank has to repay, and if it doesn't repay, you realize the collateral. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Paul Tucker. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.